And I have to say that um, uh, producing a Zoom service uh, with an interactive slideshow does require a degree of technical expertise. So I'm very grateful to Mark and to Tony and also Simon, who's off of the slip disc, for actually coming in and sorting this all out. So thank you very much uh, for this and thank you for coming. And, uh, and I welcome all those um, watching on Zoom now or later. Some will be local, but I know some will be around the world. And I'm fairly confident that uh, there'll be people in America uh, uh, watching this. So it's quite extraordinary that a small church like Christ Church Jewel can have a worldwide ministry, such as the power of Zoom. Um, it's upside down. It's not a good start, is it? At school, I did take part in many sporting activities. And, and one of the few photographs that survive is um, me and the rugby team. Now, you're probably not close, close enough up to it, uh, but that's actually me in the middle, in the front of the middle, holding the ball. Uh, whether we had a good season or not, I can't remember, but that is, um, that is me. Uh, now, that is not me, uh, sadly. Uh, but I used to enjoy track events and the 800 meters was my, uh, uh, I won a few times, but I think my greatest claim to fame is that I won the Interhouse Cross Country. And um, this is a very different kind of race from 800 meters, which basically is twice around the track at full pelt and it takes about two minutes. But long distance running over rough country, lasting in our case 40 minutes, uh, it does take a very different mindset. And I remember the pep talk given on the day by our housemaster, and uh, who'd been a sergeant during the war. And uh, his pep talk went something like this. He said, well, boys, this is going to be the toughest race of your life to date. When you get out there, You'll be running on tracks, and you won't be running on tracks. You're going to have to jump ditches and wade through streams. But whatever, you must keep going. Your job is to overtake the person in front of you. And when you've done that, you keep going to overtake the next person in front of you. You have to press on at all costs, until you have crossed that finishing line. Well, that, ladies and gentlemen, is the sermon for today. Except, of course, it's never quite that simple, uh, because we do have to read what Paul has to say. So shall we just have a moment of prayer? So, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can... Uh, read your words and that you will teach us what Paul is saying to the church at Philippi and that you'll open your minds to what you are saying, that we will be the most effective church we can be to your honour and the glory of your great name. Amen. Well, this is uh, the, uh, the fourth sermon in a series of Philippi Philippians reason titles to be cheerful. And as you've probably guessed already, uh, today's title is Pressing On. And we've already learned from the series that Philippi was a church founded by Paul with the help of a ladies' prayer group. Seemed to be a very sound church and supported Paul's ministry financially on a number of occasions, often on giving on their own volition. The Philippian church, knowing that Paul was in prison, probably in Rome, had heard he was ill. So they sent one of the brothers, Epaphrodites, to care for him. This is not exactly a photograph of that occasion, but um, uh, it gives you the feeling. But Epaphrodites became ill and almost died 
and the church became worried about him. And Paul decided that the best thing to do was to send him home to the Philippians so they would know he's okay. And with him, Paul sent this amazing letter. Looking back on the series so far, there for me have been three particular highlights, which uh, I couldn't resist mentioning. And uh, I have to thank Debbie for the first two. <laughs> And Philippians 1, verse 9, this is Paul's wonderful prayer for the Philippians and through scripture for all of us. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and be pure and blameless until the day of Christ. And I'd like to make a suggestion. When you read this, Make it a personal prayer. Say it in the first person singular. So it sounds like this. This is my prayer, that my love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, that I may be able to discern what is best and pure. What would it look like? What would it feel like if our love had more knowledge and depth of insight. For a start, we'd be able to discern what is best. Philippians 1, verses 21 to 26, Paul, knowing that he could be facing execution, is speculating about his death, an issue that's engaged my thinking in recent weeks. But Paul can say, for me, to live as Christ, to die as gain. But Paul goes on to define the gold standard for Christian anticipation of death. Paul says, well, I'm ready to go, but I'm prepared to stay, if there's work for me to do. And to be honest, I don't think I'm quite there yet, I'm probably prepared to go, but I think I'd rather stay around a bit longer. So your prayer for me can be that the Lord will give me plenty of work to do so I can justify staying on. And uh, Philippians 2, 6 to 13, Simon brought to us Paul's magnificent hymn of praise to Jesus Christ. And Paul could say, echoing Isaiah, at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord. So confident is Paul in the person of Jesus that even in AD 60, he could envisage a global acceptance of Jesus Christ as Lord. And as Ray was saying, we're getting there. <coughs> We're getting there. And Philippians 3.10 is important because it's the verse that we finished on last week. And it's Paul's great aspiration that he wants to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and a fellowship of sharing in his suffering. But we start today <coughs> um, with Paul's emphatic response said, not that I have already obtained all this or have already been made perfect. And uh, it's a bit of theology here, but Paul is talking about sanctification, the process of becoming holy, and it takes time. And if Paul has not achieved it, it's probably unlikely that any of us have. But Paul's remedy is but I press on. And this is very important. There's nothing static about the Christian life. Being static is dangerous. And the writer of Hebrews reminds us, we must pay more careful attention so we do not drift away. 
I think there's actually a slight typo on that slide, uh, which I'm sure was spotted. And um, that we do not drift away. And it's uh, the words there are used of, of a boat that slips its mooring in the night and slowly sort of drifts down the river. And by morning time, it's sort of hitting the shallows and they're hitting the rapids. And so we must be careful not to drift away. Paul had a particularly dramatic conversion when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus. And he, was not and he was determined not to let go of Christ until he had taken hold of or appropriated uh, all of that Christ had in store for him. And this to me felt a bit like a wrestling match. And it reminded me of that rather curious story in Jacob, uh, of Jacob in Genesis 32. He's running away from his brother Esau. He sent his family away and he's alone on a riverbank at night. And verse 24 says, and a man wrestled with him till daybreak. And the man asked Jacob not to let him go. And Jacob replied, no, not unless you bless me. The man replied, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and overcome. And Jacob was blessed. And I just feel that um, Paul has that same sense of determination and purpose, aggression even, never to let go. The Christian life is one of active engagement. And uh, this is actually out of management handbook, but I thought it was quite a, that we're all actively engaged in the Christian life. And in verse Paul, uh, 13, Paul reminds us again that he's not yet taken hold of this. But one thing I do, and uh, this is very important, because Paul says, getting what lies behind. And it's important, I think, because the past can have a power over us, reminding us of past failures and disobedience and can have a disabling effect on our Christian walk and witness. But Paul knew the scriptures, as we do. And Jeremiah 31, for I'll forgive their iniquity and remember their sin no more. God has the power to forget our sins. I think when we go to heaven and start apologizing to God for our past failures, he may well say, well, I've no idea what you're talking about. With God, forgetting goes with forgiving. And Isaiah's wonderful words, forget not the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. And it goes on to say, now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I do believe that as we exit our winter of COVID discontent and enter the sunny uplands of a new normality, God is going to do a new thing for our church. I think he will bless our faithfulness and give us opportunities for growth that we could not have imagined 12 months ago. And we will rejoice in the new thing that God has already started to do. So if we repented of our sins, we can trust God for forgiveness. We can put the past behind us and press on to what is ahead. Paul actually says straining towards what is ahead. And you can sort of feel the effort and energy we're expected to show. And in verse 14, uh, Paul used the analogy of, I press on towards the goal for the prize that God has called us. 
And this is Amy Williams, MBE, who won the skeleton race in the Winter Vancouver Olympics. I actually find it quite difficult getting both a man and a woman together for an Olympic medal, because not too many of the sports are actually mixed. So I thought, um, well, I'd let, let ladies have the, have the show this morning. So uh, this is one of our gold medalists. But Paul goes on to say, only let us live up to what we have already attained. Very important, you know, we're pressing on, we've got to hang in there, but we've got to live up to what we've already attain, attained. And spiritual drift is very dangerous. And I think Paul's well aware of this. And we can see this in people, people perhaps we know. And we can see this in nations. And the last 80 years of the history of our country is a rather poignant reminder of this. In the summer of 1940, Britain faced a threat of invasion with the air war intensifying over London and the Southeast. And only the fighter pilots of the RAF were saving us from disaster. But we had a godly king, King George VI, the father of our present queen. And he called a national day of prayer on Sunday, the 8th of September. And it was held in a packed Westminster Abbey. It might actually even have been broadcast, not sure about that. But the final prayer began on that day. Remember, O oh God, for good, those watchmen who by day and night climb into the air. Let thy hands lead them, we beseech thee, and thy right hand hold them. The battle continued ferociously for another week. But by, the, but by the following Sunday, Sunday the 15th September, the enemy had conceded the battle and the Battle of Britain was won. September the 15th, that is my birthday. Just, just a note for the diaries, okay? Uh, not 1940, um, I, I'm a bit later than that, but uh, I'm proud really to have my date of birth associated with this uh, great battle. Um, and you know, our country was blessed with peace, with victory, with peace, prosperity. But something has changed since then, hasn't it? And um, I've called it a lost heritage. And I've called it the ABC of decline. That estimated in 1949, about 40% of the nation regarded themselves as regular uh, churchgoers. Now, I think that 40% is probably a bit generous, but nevertheless, it was a lot more than it is now. But we certainly know today that that figure is down to about 4%. And I called it the ABC of decline, because in the past, everybody attended, they believed, and their conduct was commensurate. But people stopped attending. After all, you don't have to be a Christian to go to church, do you? That's what they said. But of course, inevitably, once attendance dropped, with no instruction, people stopped leaving. And with no guiding principles, conduct would change. And um, I think when we read the following verses, we perhaps um, can recognize what Paul is saying in his own, own day and probably recognize something of the situation we live with now. And the danger is that so every heading is probably a sermon in itself. But these are the things that Paul lists, people living as enemies of the cross. And that really could be anybody, but there's a sense in which people, some people think Paul's probably referring to Christians, Christians who are not living up to their calling, using their liberty for license, which Paul speaks about in Galatians. 
And he says, people whose destiny is destruction. And that could refer to any kind of wickedness. And this is an interesting one, whose God is their stomach. Well, we all like good food, don't we? But for some, it becomes obsession. Foodies, people who can talk about nothing else. And we've met such people. It's quite extraordinary. It doesn't matter what you try and talk about. It could be the Euro. And I'll tell you, there's a wonderful Swiss restaurant down from the Bergamont in, in, uh, in, in Brussels. But um, they can become obsessive. And of course, it's the age of the celebrity chef, nouveau cuisine, cookbooks, TV programs abound. The recently delayed final of MasterChef, which I have to admit, I do watch, um, had a viewing attendance of 5.3 million. And that's more people than go to church. But with such indulgence, we have an obesity epidemic. And bizarrely, this also commands its own TV shows. And uh, Paul goes on to say, they're glorious, they're shame. Perhaps people whose lifestyles are applauded in the media, but are clearly contrary to the word of God. But Paul's final condemnation, and the real root of all these issues is, their mind is on earthly things. And I think this is important for us, because I think the greatest threat to the church in the West is not persecution, but assimilation. And I know personally some of the challenges here in our attempt to reach out, to be relevant and inclusive, we can end up looking more like the world than we do looking like Jesus. But Paul gives us a timely reminder. Our citizenship is in heaven. Philippi was a colony of Rome, and Paul saw that the Philippian church is a colony of heaven. And we at Christ Church Yule are a colony of heaven. And, uh, but we as a church are a waiting church. In fact, we are eagerly awaiting. And we are waiting a savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul goes on to tell us what will happen when Jesus returns. Well, two things. Jesus will have the power to bring everything under his control. Does it sound extraordinary? Jesus running the world. No wars. No political issues. No economic fairness and security. Ecologically clean and green. And uh, it's sort of something very difficult to mention. And better still, he will transform our lowly bodies so that we will be like his glorious body. Wow, don't we look forward to that? No more aging, no more getting ill, no more sick. We'll be, well, we know, young, fit, active, glorious. And we probably won't need an NHS anymore. But, uh, but I'm still sure there's still be work for those people to do. So that's what we're waiting for. And that's what we're expecting. We're expecting that Jesus will bring everything under his control and that our bodies will be transformed. But I would summarize like this. As a church, we are a church that is pressing on, despite everything, pressing on to take hold of Christ and to appropriate all that he has for us. And we must forget what is behind us because we're pressing on. We must live up to what we have already achieved. We must be distinctive and not compromise. We could probably have added, <clears throat> and be prepared to declare the word of God's truth. And we wait for the return of Jesus. So we press on, okay? That's our task. We press on and keep going. And may the Lord bless us.